good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jake Chen. I'm speaking on behalf of my student who didn't get a visa in time to come to this wonderful meeting, and pity for him. Uh, what I'm going to talk about this morning is this a new uh, database resource that we uh, created called the Pager, and uh, some of the analysis that you can uh, do uh, with the database. Um, just to quickly review uh, what most bioinformaticians are doing to interpret the omics results. Right? So we have lots of omics results, um, NGS, microarrays, proteomics. You do all these wonderful analysis, and then one of the paths is that you do gene set analysis. And the question you can get out of that is, so in what gene, go ontolo gene ontology terms are my genes enriched? And then another path that you can do is the pathway analysis. You just try to uh, overlay your significant genes on top of a, a pathway diagram with up and down regulated genes. And then you can answer questions such as what curated pathways are my genes showing up? Or you can do a network analysis and then uh, you can ask the question, what genes of my interest relate to each other? So this seems to be a wonderful world. Um, until um, that there are lots of uh, analysis tools that many of them are developed by people in the audience, and I would call them the GeneSight Pathway uh, Network Analysis GPNA tools. And these tools allow us to uh, characterize functions of the genes, understand biological systems, and develop biomedical applications. And some of the examples are overrepresentation analysis tools such as David, uh, gene set scoring and ranking tools such as uh, GSEA, a network char characterization tools, um, something that we develop, uh, uh, and then a multi skill network analysis tool that take advantage of a higher level structure within the data itself. And just to give you a sense of what are uh, the uh, GPNA analysis examples, on the left side is uh, some work that were done in my research group uh, a while ago. Uh, we actually take uh, close to 1,000 GWA studies and take all the genes uh, between them uh, and then uh, try to overlay it uh, as a seed to form a network. And this is for type 2 diabetes. And you can see the colored node uh, indicate genes that are enriched with uh, uh, significant GWAS uh, uh, just associated uh, SNPs. Um, and then uh, you can actually form simple networks to do analysis. A more complex analysis is shown on this side, and I call it dynamic multi skill network or functional analysis because each node here doesn't represent a gene anymore, it represents a, a gene ontology term. So you actually have to do a gene ontology enrichment study first before you actually put them onto a network. And the more complicated study is that you can actually look at the, uh, the temporal analysis. So for a study like this, we are actually pretty deficient on the tools. And in fact, if you think about it, to do this uh, GPNA analysis, you need to actually go to many different kind of databases, and some of them are quite incoherent. And some of the databases are uh, OMIM, uh, GAD, and Gene Ontology. They're more functional information manually curated. Or you can go to the uh, pathway databases, uh, Reactome, CAG, and so on. Or you can go to a gene signature database that's more comprehensive. Or you can go to some of the uh, integrated uh, knowledge repositories. But in any ways, it's very inconvenient. And the uh, convenience is only one of the reasons why we developed this uh, database called the Pager that's uh, uh, hosted online now. We really want to support this uh, GPNA analysis by one-stop shop. Uh, we integrate data from different uh, sources. And most notably, and this database contains 38 thousand of such structure that we call PEGs, which is uh, representing over 150% more data than the uh, uh, MSIG DB. And we also want to reserve the ability to do systems biology later to add uh, interaction details 
and provide some sense of the quality, uh, how diverse or how, how heterogeneous these data are in terms of biological relevance. So what exactly is a PAG? So since I call it a term, it's actually, it's an integrated gene set uh, pathway network analysis. It's a data representation concept. It, it can be pathway with or without the structure of the details, or it could be an annotated list that are expert curated, or it could be gene sets that are actually gene signatures from uh, large omics experiments. Right. And uh, here's a, uh, a naming uh, uh, standard that we developed to try to capture the diversity of data sources. Let's say the type of data could be ontology pathway, functional genomic, and so on. Or the diversity of derivation method and can be experimentally derived, computationally predicted from literature, or simply unknown or the relationship de details and at the very beginning maybe it's just a list and therefore no relationship map. And increasingly in the future for network biology application, you may have chemical reactions and uh, the dynamic models. So just take an exa example, you have three positions and uh, several digit, and this is a, uh, a pack that describes this uh, leukemia uh, related uh, gene signature. And one thing that you may notice that, that there's a cohesion measure and I'll talk about it later. So the actual data sources for uh, this uh, pager 1.0 came from these, uh, such a high, uh, large variety of data sources and were downloaded uh, at different time. And one of the questions that you may ask is, is this comprehensive? I would say that this is far, far less comprehensive. If you think about there are uh, 20,000 human genes, and then to make these uh, human genes into any kind of a configuration of sets, and that space complementarily is extremely large. Obviously, not all of them make sense, but I think uh, this represents only the starting point for maybe a, a community effort. And to define the biological relevance, we use a measure called COCO, which actually has two parts. One is a CoI, the other is CoT. The idea is very simple. CoI is simply to assess the enriched PPIs, therefore the I's in the PAG. And T is a triangle, PPI form the triangles. And this is a formula for it. And you may actually rec recognize this is the function for hypogeometric distribution density. And uh, there's a known formula that if you actually plug in the theoretical PPIs, the actual PPI found in the, uh, in the place, in the database, and the small n is the theoretical number of uh, this inside a pack, and this is the actual, you can actually pretty much calculate the probability density. And we take a negative log to make it uh, actually nice looking and the signs simply indicate whether it's an overrepresentation or underrepresentation. And for CoT, we're simply looking at the triangles. Actually, this should be assessed in reach the triangle, not the PPIs. And everything else being the same, and then the sign also is the uh, compare the expected triangle count versus the actual. And to uh, take you through uh, an example, right? So this is a particular PAG. Let's say we use an interaction protein interaction database, and we found that in this universe of uh, different PAGs and then this particular PAG, within this PAG, we found these interactions. And uh, I think you can count it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 11 inside, and um, if you look, looking at the triangles, there are three triangles inside. And then you're starting to ask the question, uh, is this enriched uh, in terms of the PPIs? Is, is it in enriched in terms of the triangles? And then you do a final calculation. Does it really work, right? So here's uh, what we did for the validation. So we looked at the true PAGs found in the, uh, the entire pager database. 
we didn't make any contribution ourselves uh, because all of the packs are integrated from the different sources. And then uh, the distribution looked like this, right? The average score is uh, for 11 for CoI. And when you're looking at the random, and uh, we make it such that it's actually right around the one, and it's very nice uh, property. And the separation is very good between the CoI and the CoT, two different classes. And then we also ask the question, well, uh, can you use this to predict whether this is a true pack uh, and it's not a noise, right? Imagine in the future if some of you are deciding to curate uh, the new packs and submit it to the database. And the very challenging question is to look at what are the noise and randomly generated by your student's computer program and what are the actual true packs. So we make a little bit of a stricter a definition of a true pack is size is greater than one for CoI, size greater than two for uh, CoT. Uh, and then the negative set is uh, some kind of a, a randomly pick uh, uh, packs that are the same size. And then we try to actually make a balance of positive and negative, and then we, we did the prediction. And we found that actually the, the COCO score, the huge advantage is actually it overcome the individual potential biases of CoI and CoT and have a much better balanced ROC curve profile. In fact, you see that the size seems to matter a little bit and the CoI tend to uh, predict the uh, bigger size uh, packs because the bigger size pack tend to have more interactions uh, already covered inside the pack. And then the CoT tend to actually, uh, well, still a little bit bet uh, better uh, here, but uh, I think it's a more balanced. Okay, so we'll switch gear and uh, we'll talk about uh, what are the type of other information that we uh, cover in the uh, pager database. And uh, that type of information, we call it the pack pack relationship, right? As you can remember from the previous examples, we're not only interested in jin jin relationship. There are really two types of relationship. One is called the M type, is when you're looking at the two packs overlapping with each other you can actually use the hypergeometric distribution again to actually figure out exactly uh, that overlap is significant or not. When it's R type, we call it regulatory type. And it's actually, we're looking at the relation, the, the regulatory relationship between pack A to pack B, where the regulatory relationships is at the gene level, but we try to actually consolidate it from the gene level to the pack level. So imagine that there are enough directed edges from A to B and not the other way around. And then simply by, again, plugging into these functions, you can get uh, to calculate the enrichment status. And here's what we observe on this new R-type uh, pack pack relationship data. And first is uh, based on the hypergeometric distribution, we're actually not getting a lot of the R-type pack pack relationship. The data coverage is relatively uh, low, meaning that there's an opportunity for additional research to find the, uh, the, the relationship. But nonetheless, we discovered about uh, 6,700 relationships for our type, and then covering uh, 3,300 uh, regu regular packs. But for these regulatory relationship, if you actually try to form a network among the pack itself, it's actually very well connected. So out of these uh, 3,300 regular packs, 3,200 of them, or 97%, are actually forming a large connected component. That means they're, uh, whatever we found is actually uh, right on the spot, uh, statistically. And then uh, we also look at the node degree distribution and average degree of connectivity is about two and, uh, uh, and some other statistics. So I'll give you an overall statistics of the database 1.0. In fact, this database, and I would uh, encourage you to substitute uh, 
your future GSEA analysis with maybe the pager database because it simply has more, right? So across all the different uh, organisms and the splice variants, we actually cover 40,000 gene-gene relationship and there are lots of gene-gene uh, -gene relationship that include the uh, protein-protein interaction information from a previous database that we developed called HAPPY, H-A-P-P-I, and some gene regulation database uh, collected from various sources. And the pack coverage in human is 35,000. There are single 10 pack and there are actually um, regular pack that's had more than one members. And these uh, number of uh, pairs, if you don't try to cut it off uh, through uh, a p-value threshold, and it can be huge, but once you, uh, once you threshold it, um, uh, uh, depending on how you threshold on the website, you can actually get uh, more stringent uh, type of uh, relationship pairs. And there's a web interface, and I'm not gonna go through details here. But let me actually walk you through a case study, okay? And this case study is using the actual data set from a collaborating researcher from, uh, uh, from Purdue Cancer Center. They're interested in looking at the myelin-derived uh, suppressor cell, MDSC. So MDSC has been identified in many cancer patients with the, uh, uh, the ability to actually suppress the T cell activations. They're induced by tumor factors and uh, they actually turn from uh, tumor killer cells to tumor helper cells. So it's very important to study them. And in this experiment, they studied actually two di different conditions, uh, the normal and the control, and there are many differential expressed genes. This is what would, you would have actually uh, got if you actually simply take this to do a single gene regulatory network analysis. You're gonna actually have less overlap because of the data coverage, 256 genes, no pack, and the uh, regulations this much. But if you're actually using the new PAC uh, infrastructure, you actually have a lot more of your genes covered simply because you're using gene sets uh, to expand your, your list of genes and then you're getting uh, regulations and a PAC-PAC relationship as well. And this is a figure that's shown up here, right? Sitting at the center actually is uh, going between upstream and downstream is a very large pack that contains genes responsible for your immunity functions. It's actually down-regulated. You can see clearly that it's a MDSC is coincident with the biology that this is indeed uh, a process that suppresses Im immunity. And also going upstream, you can find many processes like activated cell growth and so on. And I'm all, almost done. And downstream is the uh, and these processes. And you not only can actually get the high level detail, you also can go down the list and, uh, and examine the structure. So in summary, the PACs uh, we believe are really unified representation and the database uh, is well integrated. We pr propose a, uh, a evaluation method and these relationships are quite useful for network biology studies. And of course, and there's lots of future work, for example, how do you improve the data coverage and uh, how do you actually curate additional details within PACS? And with that, I'm ready for some questions. Thank you. Maybe only one question so we can continue and reasonably catch up with the time. If there is. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, they're all, uh, they're part of the pack, and uh, they're really tight, and they would have a very high COCO score. Um, we don't try to, uh, well, you can actually go on the uh, web and then try to filter them out if you want, but uh, other than that, we're not doing, uh, making decisions for the biologists. But I'm here, and if you have other questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you very much. <laughs>